we'll get straight to the Bible. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 12. So in, we've been dealing with different teachings from Christ. He begins the book of Matthew saying, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And I believe that theme, so far it has, and, and, and I haven't read too far ahead, but I believe that theme carries out through the Bible in, in Matthew as, as he's trying to lead his disciples in a direction to where if they follow, he will make them into fishers of men. The end goal, then, is simply to follow Christ and let him do the work through us. Last week, we were in this chapter, and we talked about, follow me to reach the world. And we were in Matthew chapter 11, and in preaching through that and into chapter 12, we saw that Christ was beginning to transition from his intention to go into the lost sheep of the house of Israel to revealing that his actual desire is to reach the world. The Bible says in 12 and 21, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. And so that was his goal, was to reach the Gentiles and open up his way of salvation to them at that time. Of course, Gentiles always could have been saved. The disciples were of Galilee, the Bible says. Galilee of the Gentiles was where they resided. And so... He didn't close off any people group at any time. In fact, it was the demand or it was the command to his people Israel that they would go and be a light unto the Gentiles through their living of the commands, through their following of the law, through their teaching of the scriptures in that way and the other different um, exhortations that Christ gave them. Nevertheless, they forgot about that and so Christ came and specifically the Bible says rent that um, Baal and Twain as a sign that he had opened up things to the whole world, and now they could enter in freely through Christ and his sacrifice. So at, after chapter 12 and in verse 21, we see a little bit of a break until chapter 13, where Christ turns from instructing specifically his disciples to actually a rebuke to the Pharisees, by way of a general teaching to the people. Look at verse 23 of chapter 12. It says, And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, and Jesus knew their thoughts. And continues in that sermon area where he just says, You know, O generation of vipers, he, 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 he says, you're, you're, you're blaspheming. And, and, and starts going at them specifically <clears throat> in rebuke. Okay, so I'm going to leave that aside and go to chapter 13 where he turns again back to his disciples. Matthew chapter 12, sorry, in verse 46, it says, while he yet talks to the people, okay, Behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak to them. So Christ for a while was speaking to the people. Then the people say to him, Your brethren are here. It says in verse 47, One said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my mother and sister, or the same is my brother and sister and mother. So Christ here goes from teaching the people back to his focus being specifically on the disciples. What he's teaching them here is that blood is thicker than water. We've heard that before, right? Blood is thicker than water. But... It's not the blood that we think of. It's the blood of Christ that's thicker than water, not fleshly blood of our family members. That's exactly what he says. He's like, what is my mother and my brethren that are standing without and desiring to speak to me? More than these, my disciples, behold them as my family. These are my kindred. These are my close beloved ones. 
You can turn to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis 29. And as you go to Genesis 29, in that idea of blood being thicker than water, in other words, the blood of Christ that connects us being thicker than water, the Bible says in Luke 14, 26, if any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, this has often been looked at as a confusing passage in Scripture. How can I hate my child? How can I hate my wife? How can I hate my brethren? How can I hate my own life? I can never be a disciple of Christ. And yet we see here that Christ, yes, is highlighting. And of course, when he was dealing with the people, he wasn't telling him them that his brother and his mother without are just nothing to him. He hates them. But specifically, he was saying that those that are my disciples, those are the ones that are closest to me. These are family unto me. Now, when he says that to be a disciple, you have to hate all others, he's using hatred in a term that is clarified in Genesis chapter 29. Look with me in verse 30. And he went in also unto Rachel, and he loved also Rachel more than Leah and served with him yet seven years. Verse 31, And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And so I believe people have often heard that said, that he's not saying to actually hate your father and mother, but he's saying you ought to love them less. And here's a biblical proof for that. Because clearly... It says he loved Rachel more than Leah, and God's interpretation of that is that Leah was hated. She was loved less than her sister at that time. And so that's what is being expressed here when Christ says, Behold my disciples, and showing hatred or less love for blood family, as it were. Now I believe that Mary and his brethren were eventually born again, but... That doesn't deny the simple truth that's being expressed here. Back in Matthew chapter 13 then, like I said, he's getting back to from dealing with the people to who his true heart is for. It's for his disciples. God so loved the world, of course, all of them. Gave his son to die on the cross in order that all would be saved. But you got to figure that those that are saved do have a special place in his heart. Reserved that is above and beyond. And as it were, God has hatred for the world because he loves them less than he does his own disciples. And we ought to have the same thing. We ought to have hatred for the world. Why? Because we love it less than we do Christ. First and foremost, our love ought to be for God Almighty God. Okay, so we're going to continue in Matthew 13, in verse 1. It says, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat. And the whole multitude stood by the shore. So here, he's again preaching unto the multitude. While he has turned his gaze back unto the disciples, we'll see that the multitude is present there to hear it. But there is a special lesson specifically for the disciples that they will hear. Verse 3, he begins, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And the sun was up, and they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, to the world at large, the great multitudes, the people, maybe even some Pharisees that were sitting around, this might appear to be a cryptic and an unclear teaching. Is Christ giving a biology lesson here about how to farm? perhaps? Is this an agriculture study? But Christ in his word makes it very clear that he is speaking to them all 
in parables. Now, what is a parable? It's an earthly story that is used to illustrate a spiritual truth. Amen. And anybody who's a believer will look at that and can glean from it and understand that. Especially when God says, here's a parable. We ought to be thinking spiritual. Anytime we read the word of God, we ought to be thinking spiritual, though it does give us practical teachings about how to live a life in the flesh, it is ultimately a spiritual truth that is being put forward in all cases. Okay, so his disciples come to him and ask him of these parables, okay? Because they may be confused too because they might have looked around at the great multitude and they're all kind of like this, scratching their heads. What is this? Again, is this a biology lesson? Is this about about sowing and reaping? Is this, am I just learning how to be a farmer here? I thought this was a great spiritual teacher. What's going on? So verse 10, it says, The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But, whatso but whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand, that in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing, ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's, so for there is a because, for this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, look at this, they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should Heal them. So here Christ very clearly says that in order to fill the prophecy of Isaiah, that those that see, see not, and hear, hear not, because of their hearts that are wax gross, he says, I speak to them in parables to the end that they will not be converted. But this isn't some sort of Calvinist God that is saying, this group shall be saved, and this group will shall not be saved, and I ordain it so... Very clearly in verse 15, it says, Their heart is waxed gross, their ears dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed. Amen. Lest, just in case, just in case I see with my eyes, what Christ is saying, I'm going to cover them up. Just in case I hear with my ears, lest I hear with my ears and should understand and should be converted, they're going to close them. They were the ones that decided they didn't want to hear God's truth. Therefore, they will not be converted because they desire not to be converted. They will not hear and see because that's not what they want. They will not be healed because they don't want anything to do with Christ. They're there, these groups, these multitudes are there for the healings in the flesh. They're there for the provision in the flesh. And they're there for the teaching in the flesh. And that's about it. What went she out for to see, he asked when all those multitudes went to John the Baptist. What are you looking for here? And I think he's doing the same thing. He knows they've closed their eyes. He knows their hearts. And so he continues to speak in parables, but he also provides a way that his own people, those that he loves more, will have understanding of these parables. It says in verse 11, It is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. We're talking today about follow me, bearing seed. Unto you this is given. The seed is given unto you to take with you, to have with you, for comfort, for strength, for encouragement, to get the work done. That's what's given you, and Christ here is going to show that. Look, most people put no value on this. If I was ever to lose even this tangible Bible, I'd be crushed by it. It was given me to bear with me. And I can put these things in my heart and in my mind and I can take them with me and the understanding that I get out of them, that's given me. It's a gift. We stand here with a precious word that was given 
unto us. And Christ is clear. Verse 16. Now what a truth this is. But, well they have closed their eyes and will not be healed. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. And that is so true. Because when you go back and you read the prophets and the law, and even Moses, as we read about in the first sermon there, had that special interaction with God, one-to-one, face-to-face, hearing from Him. He did not have the blessing that we have. The ability, the provision, the gift to be able to see these things. Why? Because they simply weren't written yet. They simply weren't revealed yet. They knew a lot of truths, New Testament truths back in the Old, and we can see that as we read from Deuteronomy. We're getting New Testament teaching, aren't we? Right? Right? As we read through um, Joshua and we watch the life of David, we're getting New Testament preaching. As we read through Isaiah and his prophecies that, that seem to resonate through time, we're getting New Testament teaching, but he desired to see the same things that we now see. He desired to hear the same things that we hear with the level of clarity that we have. And this is a gift unto us. Not only is this a give that puts us above in measure of blessing the world and those that would reject Christ, this also puts us above in the area of blessing to even the prophets that went before us. Peter said we have a more sure word of prophecy. Even above the visions that I saw, he said, whereunto ye do well to take heed. Hear these words. See these words. and Be blessed. It's given to us. Verily, others before us wish they had what we have. We have this open book, and God has certainly blessed us with it. <clears throat> Verse, oh, let's go then to Mark chapter 4. Keep your finger in Matthew 13. Mark chapter 4. I just want to look at this from a different angle. We're only about 40 or so pages over. Not even. 30 pages in my Bible. In Mark chapter 4, he's highlighting this again. In verse 10 it says, And when he was alone, they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. So this is on the heels of that same parable of the sower that went forth to sow. He says that same command. Obviously it's recorded. I believe that's the same time frame. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. But as often is the case, Mark gives us this story in a more concise fashion. It's a smaller book. Mark tends to be more straight and to the point. But he also, though it is just a repeat of what happened in Matthew, there are some important points. And look at here in verse 10. We're now in verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without all these things are done in parables that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven. Then we've seen all this. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? Now watch this. And how then will ye know all parables? Okay? So this parable, I believe, is foundational to all parables that are about to come. And it's the first time we see Jesus really transitioning with his disciples into things that are plain, straightforward teachings that we've learned so far as we've been walking through this study. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And some of the examples are to the common people, right? The common people heard Jesus gladly. Follow me to doctrine with application. Simply, this is the command, do this, apply it, and and, and it's fine. Faithfulness is foundational to the walk with God, glorifying God. This ought to be our goal and our motive. Follow me forward, press on even when it's hard. Follow me to reach the world. Now he's saying... Follow me, bearing seed, and this is something that is a stepping stone, I believe, to knowing all parables. And that's what Mark gives us an indication of here. If you don't know this parable, how shall you know all parables? And look how it starts off. Verse 14, the sower soweth the word. That's an awesome 
example of something that Mark gave us that isn't completely just straightforward given to us in Matthew. We can glean it as we read, but right there, Mark just very clearly lays it out. Hey, that sower that went forth to sow was sowing the word. Okay, we can go back to Matthew chapter 13 with that in mind. In verse 18, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 18, it says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed unto stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon with joy he receiveth it. You see how you can glean that without that straightforward statement? But I love that Mark just puts it out there. The seed is the word. Verse 21, Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation and persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. Now Christ here now that he has his disciples aside and they ask the question, gives it to them very plainly, doesn't it? Now, I don't know, we could all be honest with ourselves and say that maybe the first time we read the parable of the sower, we just read it like the people might have. Is this just like a horticulture study? What's going on here? Maybe we gleaned a little bit, but I'm glad that God later gives it to them plain as day when they asked. We had an example of that just today. We're in Deuteronomy chapter 21. The first time I read through that and preached that, I said, something's off. This is weird. I don't really understand this. And then a few weeks passed. After I asked God, he goes, here's what I'm saying. And he laid that out plainly for me. And what a blessing that was. And this is the same thing that God is teaching his disciples. Follow me, bearing precious seed. You have the precious seed of the word of God. Take it with you. Carry it with you. Learn it. And I'll give you deeper understanding of it. Why? Because it's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But under the world, it's not. The world can understand the parable of the sower at face value. And they can learn how to grow plants, right? But there's more to it. There's the word of God here being highlighted and expounded upon and how it works in this world. How it goes about and it's sown and what the reaction is to it. Now, the first thing that we see for ourselves that we can apply is that our job here, based on the parable, is to bear and sow in all places. Look, it seems like because the seed's falling here and there and everywhere, that basically the seed, the word of God, is indiscriminately just being tossed. Where it lands to the sower that's sowing the word is of no consequence unto him. He can't control it. He isn't necessarily the one that has any, any, any bearings upon it. Where it lands is of no regard. He sows it in all places. And we ought to take the word and sow it everywhere. Everywhere we go, we ought to be trying to sow the word. Leave somebody with a tract. Leave them with a Bible verse. Proverbs is great for the world to give them wisdom. They go, wow, that sounds really great. And you're like, that's the Bible. And then they're like, ugh, never mind. Right? You can give people seed of the word of God everywhere you go. It also records, though, is how it's received is of no consequence to us. Where it lands... Okay, we've thrown it, and some maybe fell exactly where we intended, good ground. But some falls by the wayside, and some lands on stony ground. And that should be of no consequence to us. How it's received, we ought not worry about. In other words, don't restrict seed just because you think that that ground is stony. You see a guy all tattooed and biker up. Don't think to yourself, that's stony ground. He's never going to receive it, so I'm not even going to throw seed there. Now just chuck it in his face. Give him all the seed you can. It matters not where it lands or how it's received. It also matters not if it's kept. It's not of our control. The, the, the Bible here is just saying, the sower soweth the word. That's our job. As sowers, we go and we sow the word. We've been given the word. We've been given understanding of the word so that we can sow it everywhere we go. If it's kept, they get saved. 
They receive it in good ground and they hear the word, understand it, bear fruit. That's wonderful. Another way that they receive it can be among thorns where the world can choke it out. Though they believed it and got saved as a result, they become completely unfruitful and useless in the kingdom of God. That happens often, doesn't it? Some of it falls in stony places, and we've seen this, where it grows up fast as soon as it's received, and the Bible records that the reception of the word is salvation, right? And these, it's stony ground. They get a little bit of root, but the sprout just goes pew. But then what happens? The sun hits it, tribulation, struggle. They receive it with joy, but persecution comes, and it fizzles away, and it's gone. And we've seen all the types of Christians like that. We've seen those that just never get involved in anything. They get saved and then go back to their lives. We've seen those types of Christians that get saved and they come out zealously, but then they fade away and they're gone within 20, 20 days or whatever it takes, just a short while. And then we've also seen good ground, understanding, bearing fruit types of Christians. That's what we want to be ultimately. We fell on good ground. Hey, be fruitful, beareth it. Beareth more fruit, bringeth forth more seed, and therefore you're creating more trees as a result. Hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, all great numbers when it comes to fruitfulness. It starts with good ground. But what we see here is that God is ultimately in control. Now, we're continuing on down in the study, and Christ is going to give us more parables. Verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So this man very clearly sowed good seed in his field. And I want to show you basically what happens when you just hear a parable and start to interpret it. I would say that the kingdom of heaven is the good ground area, okay? So it says that he, as a man, specifically sowed into his field. And if it's your field... Your desire is that you would get lots of fruit out of it. Nobody sows not expecting good fruit. So the man goes, sows seed into his ground, but it says this, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? You sowed good seed with the intent of growing it in good ground. Your field, you possessed it. You worked it. You, you prepared it. From whence then hath it tares? Verse 28. He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto them, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat unto my barn. I believe that this can reveal to us that the kingdom of heaven is not the perfect, wonderful place that we think it is, up there in heaven where God abides. Why can we gather that? Well, because there is imperfection there. Not only are, is, is there wheat, but there's also tares among the wheat. And here, the man says, let them both grow up together in the kingdom of heaven and what it's likened unto until the time of the end when we will bring them all in, then divide them up and the tares will be burned, but the wheat will be gathered into the barn. So, good ground is sown with good seed. And the man intended that he would bring forth good fruit. But the enemy came and attacked. And as expected, God has a plan for the end of all things. Verse 31, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown... It is the greatest among herbs and becometh a tree so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. This is showing that a little word, a little seed that is sown has the potential to do great and wonderful things. That little mustard seed, though it's the littlest seed that we have, you know, though it's just, it's just when it comes to the seed being the word of God, maybe it's just Jesus wept. The tiniest little mustard seed of the word is put forth, has the potential to do great 
things, become the greatest among the herbs, even become a tree so that the birds of the air can come and lodge in the branches thereof. Verse 33 gives us another parable that teaches, I believe, the same thing. Another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And so, you know, the Bible says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. We look at leaven as sin, but it's not always sin because I have leaven in my bread and I enjoy it. It's, it's, it's puffy, it's got air pockets in it, but we know that a little bit of leaven will leaven the whole lump. Just like this little seed, this mustard seed, is able and has potential to do wonderful and great things. Continuing on in verse 34, all these things Jesus spake unto the multitude in parables. So there's a mixed group here. There's believers, there's disciples, and there's unbelievers alike. There's even false prophets and wicked heathen there, being the Pharisees. It says, And without a parable spake he not unto them. Why? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares. So while I gathered a little bit from the first reading of that scripture, and there was a few parables afterwards that explained things, here God is faithful to show what his intention is again with every scripture that we will come into contact with. His intent is while we can glean from it and try to understand it at a face value, applying spiritual truths to it, ultimately Christ wants to get us alone and reveal these things in the plainest sense. So again, we ought not to get confounded and confused and upset and offended when we hear something publicly or we read something firsthand and then go, I don't understand this. It's God's will and desire that you would bear his seed. You would bring it forth with you and you would have good understanding to be able to use it. And so, while you may not understand it the first time because it was spoken in parables, to the intent that people don't understand, ultimately Christ wants to get you alone and tell you exactly what his word means. In verse 34 and then 35 and then 36, he's sending the multitude away. And then verse 37, he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. Oh, great. I thought he was just a man the first time I read it. Just a normal, everyday man that's going about sowing the seed. It could have been me as a disciple. No, it was the son of man. He makes it clear. Verse 38 then says, The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. You know what? I gleaned that. I gathered that because, because it's the kingdom of heaven, of course, meaning that God is over it all and he is the king of his kingdom. But now we see very clearly that the children of the kingdom and the children of the wicked one are different. Therefore, it couldn't be the celestial heaven that we all think of, which is a perfect, wonderful place because there is good and bad here. There is righteous people and children of the wicked one here. It's the world that he's describing here. And we gathered that from the context originally, but now Christ makes it very clear. Verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. And therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be at the end of the world. The son of man shall send forth his angels and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, and there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear. Let him hear. So the kingdom of heaven here abides with the believers and is in the believers and those that are under Christ's headship. We can live in the world and be a kingdom of heaven amazingly, but God is showing that at the end of days via this parable, the reapers will be the angels gathering together both groups, taking the tares and those that offend and those that do iniquity and those that are unbelievers and cast them into the fire. And he will take the wheat and gather it to the barn and they will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father at the last days. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. So again, earlier we can read the parable, we can hear the preaching, we can hear the teaching, and we can receive some understanding from it. 
But later, and as has been my experience lately, God intends to show us more. You want to be a disciple. You want to be a fisher of men. Don't just take the word as it's revealed to you today and in this moment and then just be done with it, right? You can get good stuff from it. You can get practical teaching from it. But God wants you to go home and in your own personal time, take what's been preached today and say, Lord, reveal to us the parable. Lord, reveal to us the preaching. Lord, show to us what you wanted us to hear from it. And even in my, my own practice, when I go through um, my, my weekly walk, the last thing that I have is on every Sunday, I'm praying before service and in reflection. And in reflection, I'm saying, Lord, reveal to me what's been taught. Certainly, I've already gone through this as the preacher and learned a little bit more than, than would be expected as you guys hearing it for the first time. But God's intent is that the same journey that I went on this last week in preparing to deliver this message is the same journey that you'll go through in the days to come in receiving this message and understanding it more clearly. We need to be as the Bereans were, okay? Everyone focuses on the Bereans as searching the scriptures to find out whether those things were so. Standing there with arms crossed and saying, I'm going to find something wrong with this sermon. I'm going to find out whether it's so. Now the Bible records of the Bereans, they were more noble of those in Thessalonica because they received the word with a readiness of mind and to search the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. It's twofold, the activity that the Bereans did. The first thing that they did was with a ready mind, maybe with a, with a notebook out. Maybe they're, they're prepared and they've, they've put away all focus, they, all focus and distractions. They've turned their phone off. They've, they for a moment forgot about everything else in this world and they're ready. They had a readiness of mind to receive the word. Whatever's coming to me, give me more, give me more, give me more. Receiving what's being said here. And then it says, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether those things were so. They went home afterwards, and everything that was taught, everything that they learned, everything that was preached, they went over it again, and just like the disciples did. Lord, teach us the parable. Lord, show me what you wanted me to get from this. Jesus says, follow me, bearing precious seed. He wants you to follow him in that direction where you take the word of God that's received with you, and go out expecting to do something with it afterwards. And this is how he's been dealing with his disciples at this time. Again, previously, I think a lot of the things were simple, just practical, baby Christian stuff. But now he's saying, look, you're going to hear some things in a vast audience before men. I'm going to give you parables, dark sayings of old, to the end that those that want to reject it can reject it. Those that don't believe can be unbelievers. Those that want to be offended can be offended, but you have, it's been given to know the, it's been given you to know and to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And this is the intent that he has. And this is what he wants us to do. We need to cultivate that reverence again for the seed of the word of God and receive it in order that we could be fruitful with it. In order to be fruitful to the max with it, we need to go home and let it work in us every time we hear it. Verse 37, it talks about that. They gathered together the tares, and he explains very clearly who each one of us is. Look how straightforward Christ is. And he did that with me when it came to that very at first just confusing scripture from Deuteronomy 21. He came home and said, this is point A, this is point B. Just like he's saying here, he says, the, the seed is the word, or the, the field is the world, the good seed of the children of the kingdom, the tares of the wicked one, the enemy sowed them, the harvest is the end of the world, the reapers are their angels. Look how clear God wants to give it to us. It's given you to know exactly what he wants to teach. And he continues on. Verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, which when a man hath found, he hideth and for joy, therefore, goeth and selleth all that he has that he might buy it, that field. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast in the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. 
So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. And every time I read this, I think to myself, You liars. <laughs> I don't know why. I just get that impression. Because, because he's just done it twice that he's given them a parable and they came and they're like you know what is this parable and here's another parable about the kingdom of heaven they're like you know get them alone and they're maybe more embarrassed now because they didn't ask in the presence of everybody they're like now that we're in the house lord what's this parable and then he explains it to them very clearly right as he wants to he desires to this doesn't bother god and then he's like, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net. And this is the last days of what I'm explaining to you. What's going to happen? Do you understand this? And they're like, yeah, yeah. I just, I just feel like they don't. I feel like they're like, they just got hit with a whole bunch of parables. And now they're just like, okay, so the, the, the seed is the word. I get that. But now we're talking about treasures and pearls and merchants and and. Yeah, I get it, for not wanting to be embarrassed again. Okay, that's, that's what I get from, from these disciples. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> God probably smiles, and he's like, all right, I'll wait till now. You're all alone in your closets. And then you say, Lord, tell me the parable. Right, because they've kind of downgraded. They asked in front of everybody, and then they asked in front of just the disciples. And now probably later, as we should all do, they went home and they asked him in private. and said, Lord, explain to me these parables. And God would just plainly, I believe, say, hey, the treasure is this, and the merchants are this, and the pearls are this, and the net is this. It was cast. He would just give it to them straightforward because that is his desire. He wants us to know him. He wants us to bear the word of God in this crooked and adulterous generation. It's where the power is. And we need to, again, cultivate that reverence today for the seed, which is the word of God. He and it is precious, and it's a gift to us. Look, the world at large will hear Bible, but the world at large will not receive and understand it in the way that a Christian would. And in the last days, we'd be able to give the word of God to the world in a plain sense. The death, the burial, the resurrection, this is how Christ saves you. He died on the cross. Like a little child could understand. Sometimes when you deal with a little child, you may not be able to talk to them about death, but you can say, do you want to live forever? And explain to them that Jesus died on the cross and you don't have to die. And you can make things very simple to them. You can give them the word very clearly, but it certainly helps that you never, you don't stay the baby. And this is what God says. He's like, if we were to all look as Christians, the first day we got saved and someone explained to us the parable of the sower plainly as Jesus did, and then said, now that you're saved, what one do you want to be? Would anybody be like, I'm going to be a stony place Christian. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come flying out of the gates. I'm going to get a whole bunch of work done. And in six months, you'll never see me again. Would anybody say, oh, I want to be, I want to be that um, thorny Christian. You know, I'm not even going to do another go godly thing for the rest of my days. You're going to see me saved. You're going to walk away. And then next thing you know, I'm going to be playing video games, chasing money, going after women, drinking beer. I want to be that thorny Christian, thorny ground Christian. Nobody's going to do that. All of us want to be good ground Christians. We want to receive. We want to understand. And then we want to beareth it, bringeth it forth, and get fruit for the kingdom as a result of our willingness to follow after God, to learn of him, and to grow in the things that he wants us to grow in. We want to be those of the kingdom that hear and understand. And as a result, we need to get a better perspective on what the word of God is. We ought to lift it up. We ought to bear it. We ought to teach it. We ought to spread it abroad. We ought to know him. We ought to crave him. We ought to spend time with him. We ought to treasure him. When we do so, more and more we will all understand. And then when Jesus says unto us, have you understood these things? One day we'll say, yea, Lord, and it, we'll be telling the truth. I think the disciples got there too. You got to figure, give these guys some bre uh, a break. I mean, they're, they're on a whirlwind of adventure now. Their training lasted three years with Christ. And the first half of it, they were just trying to hold on to their socks for the ride that they were in. 
seeing miracles and healings and teaching and doctrine and all this stuff flooding their minds. And then Christ says, you know this? And they're like, yeah, yeah, Lord, I know it. Eventually, though, you have Peter in his last days saying, we have a more sure word of prophecy where, well, where you do well to take heed. And I think he would be answering when the parables come, yea, Lord, I understand. We have the apostle we have the Apostle Paul that says, I have ran the race, I have finished the course, henceforth is set for me a crown. And he would look at the parables, these fundamental parables, simple parables in Matthew 13, and he would say, yea, Lord, I understand them. But that's after spending time with him and, and fellowship with him and going to him in the early days. I haven't arrived at the Apostle Paul's level. I haven't arrived at the Peter level. I'm going to spend some more time like Peter making mistakes, you know. I'm going to spend some time like Peter denying the Lord when I should have stood up for him. I'm going to spend some time like Peter messing up, saying the wrong thing, okay. i got a long ways to go, but Christ ultimately wants us to end like that. Finish well. Get to the point where we can say, Yay, Lord, I understand what you're saying and really mean it. Follow me, Christ says. Do you understand? Yay. And ultimately, I understand better now than I did a year ago. I understand better now than I did two years ago. I understand better now than I did even two weeks ago when I was mixed up on some things and had to have God take me on a journey, walking me through some things. And I had to ultimately say to him, Lord, explain to me the importance of the blood sacrifice. Right? And he took me on that journey. It's been awesome, but I don't want to end there. I know better now than I did, but do I fully understand? Of course not. None of us do. But more and more every day. Verse 52, it says, Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man that is an householder, which bringeth forth out of his treasure things new and old. What a blessing that is to think about. Every scribe, everyone that is writing the Word of God, everyone that is using the Word of God, studying the Word of God, is likened unto a householder. In other words, you own the house. You're renting the house. You, you live in the kingdom. You're abiding here. Out of your treasure, you're going to bring forth new things, and old things. In other words, I'm going to be able to bring forth old things like what John 3.16 means. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I'm going to bring forth new things that I'm learning today. There's two choices in Matthew chapter, or Deuteronomy 21. Two choices. Right? Householder. Hey, I, I, I got real estate. I got a mansion there in heaven. I'm a householder. I live there. That's my home. And every day I hope to bring forth new and old treasures out of that house and out of that truth. Verse 53, And it came to pass, and when Jesus finished these parables, he departed thence, and when he was come into his own country, he taught them in the synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? And would to God that people would look at us as we teach and as we explain, and as we expound upon, and as we live the Word of God, they would look to us and say, how does this man have such wisdom? How does this man have such mighty works? The truth is, the power is in the very Word of God that we're bearing, the seed that we're bringing with us. And as we bring the seed with us, hey, we've got treasures old and new to show you from it. But look how the world receives it. Verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. The word looks at it as just words. It's just words on a paper. No big deal. The world looks at the word of God, Jesus Christ himself, in the same way. It's just, just paper. Jesus was just a carpenter's son. His brethren are here. We know where he lives. Right? But it's more to us. To us which are saved 
It is the power of God unto salvation, even to them that believe. To us which are saved, it is a precious cornerstone. To them, they'll deny it, and they'll just say, ah, well. So God says, okay, it's a stumbling stone, a rock and a fence unto you. Okay, you, you want to close your ears and shut your eyes? Lest you should hear? You can have that. So he speaks to them in parables and then brings us aside and says, this is the truth. Know the truth. Love the truth. The truth is precious unto you. And it should be more precious unto us. But we have to take the time to spend the time to learn it. Do you really want God to reveal things to you only in the same way that he's revealing it to the people? To the great multitude? To the religious liars and Pharisees? Or do you want something more? If you want something more, take the seed that's sown, give it good ground, go home and say, Lord, declare unto me the parable. Lord, declare unto me the preaching. Lord, declare unto me what I just read today. You can have something more. And he will be your precious cornerstone. It's amazing. Thank you, God.